Nelson was a military giant who dwarfed everyone around him. The tremendous hold he had over his contemporaries is reflected in the magnificent Nelson's column, built to commemorate his death at the moment of his greatest victory. Standing over 200 feet tall and cast from the bronze of captured French guns, it stands in an unequalled position in the heart of London and is testament to Nelson's outstanding bravery. In the late 18th century, Britain was at war with France and Spain. It was a world war, but in Europe the battle raged from the Baltic in the north to the Mediterranean in the south. France dominated Europe and was poised to invade her most bitter enemy, Britain. Nelson was part of the navy that would stop her. Nelson was a military genius. In the long history of the Royal Navy, there's never been anybody quite like him. He was a natural hunter-killer who believed in annihilating his enemies. He had tremendous strength of mind. He never doubted that he was right, and this rubbed off on all those who served under him. And it's this strength of character that he'd show early on in his life. When he was a little boy, uh, he got lost. He went off, wandered off one, one day, and when they found him next morning, they said, but weren't you afraid? He said, afraid, what is fear? It was fortunate that he was such a tough youngster because within a few years he would join the Navy at the tender age of 13. It was clear from the start that he had the makings of a leader for he was promoted to captain before he was even 21. Nelson would quickly move up the ranks and build a reputation as a flamboyant thrill seeker with selfless courage. Now, those qualities don't necessarily go hand in hand with those of a great commander, but his daring individualism did start to pay off. Nelson was a fearless commander. He reveled in danger. It was almost like a drug to him. It was in a battle against the Spanish fleet off Portugal's Cape St. Vincent that he demonstrated this love of danger and a reckless disregard for his own safety. Nelson was impulsive. In February 1797, his ship was part of a British force sent to attack the Spanish fleet and prevent a combined Franco-Spanish invasion of England. Nelson broke away from the British line without orders, and he personally boarded and captured two enemy vessels. It was an extraordinary feat, unprecedented in naval history. With a keen eye for public relations, Nelson himself wrote an account of the battle for the newspapers. He became the hero of the hour. A flagrant disobeying of orders would be a common theme in Nelson's life. He was a maverick, and predicting his every move must have presented a real headache to his superiors. But he was a natural leader with brilliant judgment and instinct, and his commanders couldn't fail to be impressed, even when he wasn't victorious. His next battle against the Spanish, five months later, was a disaster, but I believe it well illustrates Nelson's personal courage. Nelson tried to capture Tenerife by a seaborne assault. Surprise was lost when bad weather prevented the first attempt at landing. When Nelson finally did get ashore, the Spanish were well warned and ready. In the ensuing battle, Nelson lost 150 men and his upper right arm was shattered by grape shot. Nelson was no stranger to adversity. He'd already lost his sight in one eye in an earlier battle, and now he'd lost his right arm too. It would be a test of his strength of character. Nelson thought that the loss of his arm would mean the end of his career, and initially he became very depressed just two days after he lost his arm, he wrote to his commander-in-chief and he said, I am become a burden to my friends and useless to my country. When I leave your command, I become dead to the world. I go hence and am no more seen. I think it's a measure of the man 
that within six months of writing that letter, he's back on top, raring to go, in command, and about to fight one of his most challenging and trickiest battles, which would be a masterpiece of tactics and command. What also set Nelson apart from his peers was his ability to get people to work as a team. Such was his charisma, he inspired devotion, even love, in all those who served with him. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. This piece from Shakespeare's Henry V illustrates Nelson's close professional relationships with his captains. It's a very 21st century style of command. He's bringing his junior officers into his way of thinking, rather than simply giving them orders. It's all part of the Nelson touch. Nelson's next major task, almost a year later, was to find and destroy the French Mediterranean fleet in what became known as the Battle of the Nile. Teamwork would win the day. One of the key elements, I think, of Nelson's leadership is, is his ability to consult with his captains. And you can see that beautifully expressed in this group of documents here. Um, this is Nelson here on the left, and he's, this is the Nile campaign, and they are searching for the French fleet before the battle. Um, they don't know where they are, but they're getting some intelligence coming in. And so what Nelson does is he sets out a set of questions uh, based on the intelligence and ask his captains to, to comment on whether or not they should take a certain course of action. And then here, on the right-hand side, you can see the responses. And so he's giving them a chance to be part of the process. And that shows a confidence in his own strength as a leader. Nelson was a man ahead of his time. He saw the importance of team bonding. On the 1st of August, 1798, Nelson fought the Battle of the Nile against the French. In a daring and radical move, he used the cover of darkness, overwhelming the French fleet in Aboukir Bay on Egypt's Mediterranean coast. It was a remarkable victory. He became famous across Europe and was labeled the hero of the Nile. Nelson was wounded in the battle and went to Italy to recover. What happened next leaves a question over his right to be called a great commander when he began one of the most infamous love affairs in history and became entangled in events that would see him branded a war criminal. Nelson's professionalism had secured victory after victory against the French and Spanish fleets. But now, while recovering in Italy from a battle wound, he made a serious error of judgment. So does this fallibility undermine his greatness as a commander? What he did was certainly shameful. It all began in Naples, when he met the beautiful Emma Hamilton, wife of the British ambassador, Sir William Hamilton. So after the Battle of the Nile, when Nelson arrives in Naples, I mean, he gets quite a reception, doesn't he? Oh, he did indeed. And uh, when, when they arrived, uh, there was Sir William and Emma, and he writes later that she was in a dress with Nelson embroidered around it. She was all be Nelson. And she greeted him with, can it be possible, and fell into his arm. <laughs> the singular, yes. He certainly wasn't used to all the luxury and palaces and all the rest of it. And I think he was rather sort of bobby-dazzled by the whole thing. Nelson's usual professionalism now deserted him. Dazzled by Emma and her social circle, he remained in Naples longer than he should have done, and he became embroiled in events in which his normally good judgment would fail him. The Kingdom of Naples was under siege from the French and local rebels who wanted to establish a republic. Nelson had a fanatical obsession for monarchy and he hated all republicans. When King Ferdinand decided to evacuate his family to Sicily, along with Emma Hamilton, Nelson was only too happy to take them. The drama of the journey would cement their relationship and their love affair began. When they all got on board and started for Sicily, there was a terrible storm. Emma was looking after one of the royal children. 
I believe he had convulsions and died in her arms. But she seemed to be quite undaunted. She just got on with it and helped the queen, helped the children, and didn't seem to notice the storm. And I've always felt that that may well have been the moment when Nelson thought, yes, that is a quality I recognize. She didn't seem to know fear, and he didn't know fear. And that would have impressed them, of course. I think so. In a shocking misjudgment, Nelson now colluded with the king. Having defeated the French and their Neapolitan allies, Nelson allowed British ships to be used to imprison the local Republican rebels. And then, when the king reneged on a treaty, granting amnesty to all concerned, and began executing the ringleaders, Nelson stood by and did nothing to stop him. To those who say that Nelson was a war criminal, I say poppycock. Even if the term had been invented then, which it hadn't, this was a king of Naples inflicting punishment on his own subjects and nothing to do with Nelson. But Nelson could have prevented it and to allow British ships to be used as prisons for the Republicans was shameful. So while Nelson's conduct wasn't illegal, it was, in my opinion, dishonorable and something that no British officer ought to have done. And yet, I believe we can forgive him his flaws, because his next two battles would show him at his finest, bold, original, and back on form. The French were casting the net of their empire northwards to Denmark. In the Battle of Copenhagen of April 1801, Nelson would demonstrate his old magic that made him an unconventional but exceptional leader. In a preemptive strike, the Royal Navy took on the Danish fleet, with Nelson's squadron in the lead. In the opening moments, he took heavy casualties from Danish guns on the shore. At this point, most captains would have withdrawn, and Nelson's commander, watching from a distance, signalled for him to do so. But Nelson never gave in easily. It's said that Nelson put a telescope to his blind right eye and then claimed he couldn't see the signal. He won the day and the respect of fellow naval officers. One of them, Admiral Thomas Groves, wrote an account of the battle. It was worthy of our gallant and enterprising little hero of the Nile. Nothing can exceed his spirit. Our little hero gloriously said, I will not move until we are crowned with victory or that the commander in chief sends an officer to order me away. And he was right. Had we discontinued the action before the enemy struck, we should have gone aground and have been destroyed. Now, disobeying orders isn't necessarily the mark of a great man, but knowing when to disobey them and still be right is. Once again, Nelson had proved himself to be a brilliant leader, but there was one more thing he had to do defeat the combined French and Spanish fleet. Its existence posed a threat to Britain's mastery of the seas. Nelson was a natural predator, and he yearned to annihilate them at sea. It was a considerable undertaking, even for Nelson. He'd need more than his legendary charisma to bring victory. His plan for the coming Battle of Trafalgar would demonstrate all his tactical brilliance. Historians have always believed that he must have planned the battle way in advance. But until recently, there was only anecdotal evidence for this. At the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, a major clue has been found. And it looks as if somebody's asked him, well, how are you, how are you going to win this battle, Horatio? Um, and this is what he's done. He's turned the piece of paper over and has shown them. And what we've got is a line here which is clearly the enemy line, the continuous line. And we've got the British fleet forming up here on the left in three clear divisions. One of the divisions, as you can see, is holding the French line, the enemy line in place, part of it, while the other two punch their way through the centre of the line. It was a gamble, as it meant exposing his fleet to fire from all the enemy ships in the line as they approached without being able to fire back. It wasn't entirely Nelson's idea, it was a combination of current naval tactics, but the fact that he tried it showed another of his skills, his ability to be innovative.
Nelson joined his ship, HMS Victory, here in Portsmouth Dock for what would be the last time. His mission was to confront and smash the French and Spanish fleets off Cadiz. Thousands of people lined the quayside to say farewell to their national hero. If anyone could take on Napoleon's combined fleet and destroy it, it was Nelson. Now, more than ever, Nelson's ability to inspire his captains, his band of brothers, would prove crucial. So he got them all together here in his cabin to explain his plan of attack. Now, the conventional tactic was to form line of battle and then get as close as you could to the enemy line and blast away. But that was to give the enemy a fighting chance. Nelson's plan was far more radical. What Nelson wanted was a dogfight, a pell-mell as he called it, ship against ship as opposed to fleet against fleet. He knew that although he was outnumbered, he had the better sailors and the better gunnery. On the 21st of October, 1805, 30 miles southwest of Cadiz, off the Cape of Trafalgar, Nelson got what he was waiting for. The French and Spanish fleet had put to sea, leaving them wide open to attack. Nelson was outnumbered, 33 ships were before him, compared to a British fleet of 27. No stranger to extreme personal danger, Nelson led from the front and with his hazardous plan, steered his fleet directly into a storm of fire. Victory broke the enemy line and as she did, her cannon belched fire into the French flagship. Now the killing began. Once the French line was broken, all pretense at strategy disappeared and the battle became a pounding match, a close-range massacre. The British ships fell on the French like half-starved hounds. 45 minutes into the battle, HMS Victory becomes entangled with a French ship, the Ré du Table. Nelson is pacing up and down on the quarterdeck when a musket shot is fired from the rigging of the enemy ship. It hits Nelson on the left shoulder, ruptures his pulmonary artery and lodges in his spine. Fortunately for the British fleet, Nelson's death came too late to affect the final outcome of the Battle of Trafalgar. Such was the loyalty he commanded from his men. They fought on without him to win the day in a final gesture of commitment to the man they had come to love. When Nelson died, the fleet forgot its great triumph and its own sufferings in an astonishing and quite spontaneous outpouring of grief. Down in the gloom of the gun deck, one sailor found a piece of paper and a pencil, and he wrote a letter home. Our dear Admiral Nelson is killed. Chaps that fought like the devil now sit down and cry like a wench. Nelson had achieved one of the greatest victories in naval history. But it could have so easily gone wrong, for in a final reckless gamble, he'd fought the battle in a race against the weather. His fleet captured 18 enemy ships, but all but four of them were then lost in a storm. Yet again, Nelson had taken a risk. Yet again, it had paid off. That's the magic of the man. Nelson was a great commander and one of the greatest heroes in our long history. Certainly, he was flawed, he was vain, and he could be pitiless. But his triumphs far surpassed his faults. It's the Nelson touch, the band of brothers, duty and country before all, daring and dash, that make today's Royal Navy the best in the world. And that is the legacy of Nelson.